Brothers and Sisters, Archbishop Quevedo. Good morning, everyone. Madam, o gid nga salamat sa inyo tanan. As we say in Cotabato, or daghang salamat kaninyong tanan. Here in Manila, you say, magandang gabi at maraming salamat. I am very impressed by the worship session you just had. I'm not a very charismatic person, but I know that many people pray to the Lord in many, many ways. And I think if Benedict XVI could have seen you and heard you, he would quickly become one of you in tapping his foot on the ground like that. <laughs> I begin with a little story about a rabbi and the Pope. They said, we are always arguing together against each other. You use the Old Testament. We use not only the Old, we also use the New Testament. But you, rabbi, you don't believe in the New Testament. You don't believe in the Lord Jesus. So let us find out whom God listens to. Listens to in the quickest way possible. And so the rabbi said, okay, let us have a contest on how to pray to God. And so Benedict XVI took up his phone to speak with the Lord. And after about one minute, the connection between heaven and earth was done. And so the Pope Benedict said, Lord Jesus, we are here. We are trying to say that you are the true God. But the rabbi with me does not admit that you are the true God does not admit that God became man. So they are still waiting for the Messiah. But the Messiah has come. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. And then the rabbi was uh, said, okay, I will pray also to your, to your God. So the rabbi took up his phone called up heaven and asked for the Lord Jesus. I would like to speak with Jesus. In, in 10 seconds, not one minute, in 10 seconds, the rabbi was connected to Jesus. Jesus, how are you? And Jesus said, I'm fine, rabbi. And he put down the phone. And the Pope, how come you were connected to Jesus? Very quickly. It took me one minute, it took you 10 seconds. And the rabbi said, you see, Jesus is one of us. He is a Jew. You are not a Jew. We have to proclaim the greatness of the Lord to the rabbi. Nonetheless. And that is the topic this evening of your teaching. The context of my talk and the theme that you have this year, Proclaim the Greatness of the Lord, is the context of the year of faith. In the Philippines, the Bishops' Conference of the Philippines announced a year of the mission, a year of the mission. 
Pope Benedict announced also a year of faith. And this year of faith begins on October 11, 2012. October 11 is the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. It will end, the year of faith will end next year, 2013, on November 24. November 24 is the celebration of the Feast of Christ the King. Very appropriate. The time when the Second Vatican Council was opened to renew the faith of the church, to renew Christian life in the whole world. And the end of the year of faith, when we proclaim our faith in Christ Jesus the King. And so it is also appropriate that this teaching tonight takes place in this beautiful church of Christ the King. Christ the King. This church is a little bit smaller than the Cathedral of Cotabato. <laughs> if you have been to Cotabato, probably the church of the Cathedral of Cotabato is uh, about uh, two-thirds of this church. This church is huge. It even has a ground floor church where Bishop Bacani is now celebrating Mass. I would like then to connect this year of faith, year of mission, to the idea that you have this year. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord. And when I reflected on this theme, the first thing that came to my mind was the creation of man. The creation of the human person. And in Psalm number 8, there you have a proclamation of the greatness of creation. A proclamation of the greatness of the Lord who created the whole cosmos. World, how great you are, how majestic is your name, O Lord. You have created the heavens and the skies and the stars and the moon. You have created everything in this world, but then you created the human person and you placed him a little less than the angels and put him on the pinnacle of creation, on top of creation. What is what we are? What are we? Mortals that we are that you have made us little less than the angels and the rulers of creation. And the psalmist will exclaim, how majestic is your name, O Lord, all over the earth. This proclamation of the greatness of the Lord is what you are celebrating this year. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord. But that is at the first level of our reflection. The greatness of the Lord, the beauty of the Lord, the order of creation, and the, creation, the creator as ruler of the whole cosmos, of galaxies and stars that we have not yet found we have not yet discovered an expanding universe that is gradually being unraveled by science. All these are in the hands of God. And the greatness of the Lord, His love, His beauty, His peace and serenity, His reign over the cosmos. And we say the heavens and the human person proclaim 
God's greatness. But there is yet another level in which we proclaim the greatness of the Lord. And the time not of creation, and the time of the incarnation. We have just celebrated the birthday of the Lord, Nativity. Nine months after the Word of God became man in the womb of the Blessed Mother. And he was born and dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In this mystery of God becoming man and living among us is something very incredible indeed. So stupendous that our minds cannot comprehend how the God of the whole universe of stars and galaxies that yet are not yet discovered, how that God who created the whole universe and created the human being and placed him the ruler of this universe, the ruler of creation, on top of creation, dominate, to dominate, to subdue, we cannot imagine this mystery of God coming down to earth in the form of a human being in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cannot imagine that the God on high can come down and be born in a place where animals feed themselves. The greatness of God's love. How majestic is your name. O Lord over all the earth. That's the second level, the incarnation. And here in the incarnation, we see the God made man in Jesus growing up and beginning to do everything good on earth. He was described in the Gospels as the one who did good, who went about doing good. And his love was such that it could not be imagined by the people of his times that he would take the poor of this earth, the marginalized, the ostracized, lepers, poor people who were considered sinners, prostitutes, fishermen. He dignified them by calling them to be his disciples. Such is the kind of love that Jesus had for us. Saint Irenaeus once said, Gloria Dei, vivens homo. The glory of God is man alive. The glory of God is man alive. And you can see that again in Psalm number 8. How majestic is your name, O Lord, because you have, mere, being mere mortals, you have put us, a little less than the angels, to rule creation in your name as your stewards of creation. That's the human being, the glory of God. Vivens homo. However, there is more to it than a human being alive. Here in the person of Jesus, the God who was made man and dwelt among us. Here in the person of the Lord Jesus, you see, vivens homo, the living person who gave his life so that we might have full life. He is the person who is with the fullness of God. He is the human being with the fullness of humanity. And Vatican II, the year of the faith opens with the Vatican II. Vatican II would say that Jesus, the God-man who came to live among us, is the man par excellence the greatest person that we see, the greatest human being that we see, is this man, Jesus. Not because he is God, 
but because as a mortal, someone who would die, would die for our sake. Someone who lives, would live for our sake. Demonstrating God's love even to the neediest of all people. The man par excellence. He worked with human hands. He thought with a human mind. He loved with a human heart. That's the way Vatican II describes Jesus. But he is vivens homo, the glory of God, not because of this simply being a human being, because he showed us how to live as human beings. That we are not for ourselves, we are for others. That our lives are not lived in selfishness and self-interest, but our lives, like the life of Jesus here on earth, is to be lived for people, for my brothers and sisters. Love. And love does not say, are you a Catholic or not? The Lord Jesus gave that example. He dignified the poor who were considered sinners. He spoke with women who were Samaritans. That love was reaching out to everyone, especially those in need. That is why at the second level of the incarnation, we can see Jesus, Gloria Dei, Vivens Jesus. That there is another level of proclaiming the greatness of the Lord. We see that when you proclaim the greatness of the Lord, that greatness is personified in Jesus. He is the center of proclamation. He is the center of evangelization. We do not evangelize by teaching a book, even the sacred scriptures. We evangelize and proclaim God's greatness because we believe in a person, the person of Jesus, through God and through man. And another level of proclaiming God's greatness is the level of redemption. So creation, the whole cosmos, the beauty, the order of cosmos, the level of the incarnation, God, the word of God who was there at the beginning of creation, the word of God who is God and came down among earth on us to dwell with us. Now that man has grown up. He has dedicated himself to obeying the will of his father, doing good in order to obey his father. Being united with God his Father in prayer and in the work that he does for people. Taught by her, her own mother Mary. Her mother Mary and Joseph. They were the first teachers of the child Jesus. In the ways of God. Now he is God. His face is turned towards Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem will be the place of conflict. But in that place of conflict, he has given his will entirely to God, his Father, and let his will be done. He gave himself up in death. But that death is a redeeming death, a recreating death, a renewing death for us. That death is an expression of what he had said before he died. There is no greater love than this, than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. When Jesus lays down his life for his friends, no greater love than that, he says. But what is more astounding with regard to the love and the greatness of God's love is this, what St. Paul said, 
the truth is God died Jesus died for us who were yet his enemies not his friends God Jesus died for us because not because we were his friends but because we have sinned against the Lord and in sin we were enemies of God and God still loved us proclaim the greatness of the Lord my brothers and sisters this Jesus is the center of our proclamation when you say proclaim the greatness of the Lord you are actually saying proclaim the greatness of God who is Jesus the God man who redeemed us he is the center of proclamation and that is the whole mission that we have mission is to tell the story of Jesus to others to Asian peoples to Hindus to Buddhists to Islam in a way that is humble and in a way that is credible the new evangelization has to take into consideration first the centrality of the Lord Jesus proclaiming him in humility to others respecting their own beliefs but bold enough and courageous enough when we are asked to profess our faith to be bold to be courageous in saying my Lord Jesus my Lord and my God Islam might respect Jesus as a great prophet but as a prophet he was secondary to Muhammad Islam might respect Mary but Mary for them is the mother of a prophet and not of God but there is a convergence in honoring Jesus a convergence in honoring Mary between Islam and us and so when we can say to Islam to Buddhists to Hindus to believers of in other religions when we can say the Lord is Jesus who is my God we must do so boldly yet respectfully honestly yet humbly and in all things lovingly lovingly about Jesus the new evangelization is simply a retelling of the story of Jesus in new situations you remember the time when Jesus cleansed the temple because there were people there in the courtyard of the Gentiles before you reach the sanctuary there is a courtyard a courtyard where the Gentiles were allowed to pray to their unknown God the Gentiles who were not Jews but then they had made it into a marketplace and Jesus took a whip began to drive out the vendors from the courtyard in order that the Gentiles might be free once again to speak about the God whom they did not know this situation in the world today is like the courtyard of the Gentiles outside the faith the Christian faith are millions and millions of people who want to worship the Lord they worship him by other names they worship the Lord through other spirits but the whole world can be said to be a courtyard of the Gentiles 
And in that courtyard, we need to tell the story. The way Paul told the story to a new field of mission in Greece. When he went to the marketplace, the Areopagus, the public plaza, and began talking about the identity of a statue, a statue to the unknown God. And he began, began revealing the story of Jesus, that that statue dedicated by the Greeks to the unknown God is really Jesus himself. Jesus. He gave a name to that unknown God. The same type of mission, the Areopagus, different from the mission to the Jews in which where, G, where Paul started his mission, that same now has a new Areopagus in the world. And that new Areopagus is this court of the Gentiles. Let us take a look at how we should tell and proclaim the greatness of the Lord. Tell the story of Jesus in this courtyard. The new Areopagi of mission. There are six characteristics of this new Areopagi or new courtyard. And Pope Benedict XVI would describe these new aspects of the world in terms of culture. You have read many commentaries perhaps of how Pope Benedict XVI has evangelize culture in many, many ways. But let's describe that culture in a certain way. What is this culture that is now emerging in the globe and taking over the cultures of Asian peoples who once upon a time had a tremendous sense of the sacred, tremendous sense of the sacred, even Typhoon Sendong is attributed to the hand of God. When there is joy, Papa Salamat sa Dios. When there is sorrow, again, because it's God's will. Sometimes there is fatalism in that. And this is true not only for Filipinos. This is true for Indonesians, Malaysians, Chinese, Koreans the peoples of Asia, a tremendous sense of the sacred, a tremendous sense of sinfulness. But the emerging culture in the world does not have that anymore. It is a secular culture. There are many, many positive things about secularity. Secular the sec secularity has emphasized the freedom of individuals, the human rights of individuals. It has emphasized to such an extent that science and technology has advanced in a way we could never imagine. Secularity did that. But it has paid science and technology Somehow, a new religion. There is a new idol in the world. A new religion. And the dogma is that of science. There is no truth according to the secular mind. There is no truth other than what science can prove. And as science unravels the mysteries of the universe, even the human life, the sources of human life, the more scientists will say, there is no need of God anymore. We know the secrets. The world was created by chance at random. The order and beauty of the universe that we see is not by an intelligent being. It is by chance. So it is that many scientists now believe in a new religion, in a new truth that is not grounded on faith, 
not grounded on any religious belief. But positive things and negative things. We have to bring this culture into the court of Gentiles. And in that court, we must proclaim to that, to that situation of culture, a secular relativist culture, and say, you are wrong. There is truth beyond what science can prove. And that truth is the truth of God. And it is God who created the world. No beauty, no order uh, can be established without an intelligent being doing it. From beauty comes beauty. From order comes order. And not by chance. Not by chance. And so culture has to be evangelized. A new evangelization must take place. How do we do that? You have the answer. Benedict XVI would say, discern this situation. Discuss the situation among yourselves and see how you can enter the courtyard of the Gentiles, which is culture, and speak of God in that courtyard. And the second, the second place in the courtyard of the Gentiles is the social dimension in this world. The social dimension in this world. One of which I noticed, migration. Migration. You have a mission to the migrants. I visited Bahrain and there I met the bishop and I met OFWs, and I met people who were CFC members in Bahrain. And I noticed with great pride that the Filipino migrants themselves were telling the story of Jesus to their employers, to one another. They were telling the story of Jesus, guided by your own leaders, CFC leaders. And I was very proud that I was a Filipino Catholic at that time. But the social dimension, the migration is mixing up cultures. Asians are going to Europe. And Asian cultures, as we said, has a sense of the sacred. And when they go to Europe, they become unbalanced, especially if they are alone. If the families are alone with no spirit of community among the Filipinos, if they are alone, 